Hi, this is Paul. Uh, July 31, when I was, um, actually it was after I did the Monday video today on seeing, uh, this dropped from Rebel Wisdom. And it was David Fuller's continuation of his conversation with Jonathan Peugeot and John Verveke. And I didn't know there was a second part coming after. The first part came about a month ago. And I found this part even more interesting than the first part. I don't know if there'll be a third part coming, but this was this is really good. And I'm, I'm just kind of on my way out the door for more time off. So again, warning, you might not be getting a lot of videos. There is... Um, no, so that'll, that'll come before this video. I think I'll probably post this video a little later in the week. So there is, there is something coming, a Q and a with, with, uh, Catherine and Cassidy from the Bridges of Meaning Discord server. And if I'm available in Michigan, I'll jump into that. Uh, if not, well, they'll, they'll just have to go on their own, but that of course will have been released by the time this gets released. So let's just jump right into this video. So we kind of talked about like the this space, the conversations that we're part of and yeah. kind of who knows where you sort of draw the boundaries, but there is sort of definitely a coherence to the conversation. And I want to kind of ask where you feel that coherence is at the moment, because for me, I was really struck by recently, I did a, hosted a conversation between Paul Kingsnorth and Mary Harrington that felt to me to be sort of a very interesting coalescing of the conversation that overlaps with it's quite interesting um, as I mean, David has sort of been a journalist in some ways, you know, that's his, that's his background, his training. He's kind of been a journalist in the background and he's facilitating. He's not just a journalist. He's also, you know, run retreats and got this whole organization. But it, it's very interesting to me just watching him where his intuitive sense brings him and as he as he participates in this conversation and it was very interesting to me that it was that it was kings north and mary harrington that that really sort of captured his imagination and it's you know when we look at say journalism through the eyes of the new york times or the wall street journal or whatever um, mass media outlets there are that you listen to or you participate in or you subscribe to with, with David, of course, because he's, this is much more of a singular thing, or at least it's far smaller. I mean, of course, he, he collaborates with Ali, and he talks with his fireside group, his fireside chat. So that, that's all sort of molding him. But it's interesting to me that it's been the King's North, Mary Harrington, um, that, that element of it welling up, which, yeah, let's keep going. A lot of the conversations that you've had, Paul Vanderclay has been talking about, and they were really talking about, I could summarize their conversation, it was sort of looking at, I call, I call it the war on reality. Mm -hmm. It was this sort of sense that there is a, a war on all limitation. Mm -hmm. Mary called it a sort of... Now, in terms of trying to understand people's worldviews, just always pay attention to what they connect this word reality with. And... Yeah, there's there's so much here. It's it's hard to it's hard to unpack, and I've I, I want to, I want to, I want to take no more than two hours to make this video, so I have to keep moving. Uh, what do you call it? Luxury luxury gnosticism. Fully automated luxury gnosticism. Fully automated luxury gnosticism. And Paul talks about the machine, the sort of obliteration of any sense of place, turning everything into kind of like, I think Mary called it a standing reserve, but I think Paul would call it kind of quantification and interchangeability and that this and Paul also kind of located that in a kind of almost like a metaphysical space rather than a kind of uh, a, a defined plan by like a group of people which is where it starts becoming sort of overlaps the conspiratorial ecosystem but that for me felt like a very live fascinating exploration it felt like a kind of moving together of lots of different parts of the conversation and I know you've both kind of listened to it and it overlaps worldview is going to come up a little bit later in this conversation and again getting into the relationship between the upper and lower register where the upper register is mind um, spirit uh, these immaterial things and of course Gnosticism is coming up in this conversation and lower register is matter um, flesh um, 
uh, upper is eternal, lower is temporal. I mean, all these, and, and again, I think that reality for us is always the, where those two points meet, because that's, because if you have, if you have upper register alone, well, it's not human. It's just, it's simply not human. If you have lower register alone, it's not human either. Humanity is the nexus between heaven and earth. We are the breath of God and the stuff of earth. And, you know, I think this is, um, I think this is part of the, I think this is in keeping with the Peugeot and symbolic world as well. Labs a lot with some of the things that you've been thinking about. What, what did you make of that? And where do you feel, do you think that is sort of partly where, one of the frontiers of the conversation? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, the thing I just said was actually like motivated by this because the fetishization of freedom, right? And making it into this kind of absolute, no limits, no limits. Um, uh, I, that's one of the- when, when I heard this, I immediately thought of, oh, I'll, I'll jump to it. So when I was on vacation, John Van Donk sent me this piece by Louise Perry, and then a number of you sent me the link to her on trigonometry, and when Verveke talks about freedom, that's that's exactly where she goes with this. The narrative that you'll hear is from feminists or from progressives is that the sexual revolution was a great idea, and it was a way of counteracting centuries of... Now, if I'm going to complain about Daily Wire, I, I should complain about the little heartbeat in this thing, too. A little, a little too much, a little too much production here patriarchal repression and the problem is just that we haven't like fully implemented it that the, 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 the original idea to free everyone to prioritize freedom above all other values was fabulous the problem is that we haven't quite yet done it we need more freedom mm -hmm. we need to push that freedom lever again and again and again until everything comes right and I think that was the error I think actually freedom is not the preeminent value I think it has to be balanced against other values like what? Like restraint. Oh, <laughs> we don't like that word in the 21st century, we do we? We don't, no. All right. The things that both Mary and Paul are putting their fingers on, and then the other, and Jonathan and I have had two discussions around this, the, 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 the discovery of the collective intelligence of distributed cognition and how it has a life of its own and that we don't have a good way of talking about this or thinking about this. These are the two themes. I have a lot of criticisms about what both of them said mm -hmm. in specifics, but uh, what, what, like, like let's, let's go to the Gnosticism, right? Um, the, 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 yeah, this, 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 um, like, almost like a corrosive acid. We are, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna carry out, we're gonna, we're going to fulfill the project of the Enlightenment through absolute liberation. And what that means is that all limitations are physical limitations in our body, right? We're, we're going to you know, maybe Kurzweil, we're going to do the transhumanism thing, the rapture of the nerds, or, right, we're going to do, right? We're, we're <laughs> the rapture of the nerds. I love it. I'm going to do, I'm just going to modify my body, or I can, I'll, 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 I'll merge with my avatar. And the, like, there's all these pseudo-transcendence that's everywhere, right? And, and it's, again, as far as I can see, the only thing that justifies this is, are you getting closer to reality? No. Are, 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 are you somehow... Again, there's that word again, reality. Again, reality is, in, in reductionist materialism, reality is just lower register. In Gnosticism, reality is just upper register. For us, reality is... The connection, it's the nexus, it's the, you know, it's the back and forth. It's right at this meeting point between heaven and earth. That's, it's where the stuff of earth and the breath of God. How making things beautiful, no. You know, is there some way, you know, can you show me how this is um, uh, ethical? You might get a bit of an answer, but it's ultimately justified in terms of, well, it's about freedom and the absolutization of it. And it's like, why do you, what, like, you don't understand limits. You, so th this, now, let's move into my domain, cognitive science, constraints. The problem with words is words can be marked or unmarked, uh, just quickly. So if I say to you how... And uh, I've heard him mention this before, but it, I didn't really get it until his telling of it this time, this marked and unmarked. Um, I, w I would say perhaps words can be tagged or they have a valence, they have a valence tag on them. How tall is someone? That doesn't mean anything, but if I say, how short are they? That means they're short. 
The problem with the word constraint. And, and okay, so again, tall is a a positive valence, a positive value, and short is a negative value. Now, why we can get into archetypes and all of those kind of things, but a tall is closer to heaven, I suppose. Tall has a sense of authority. I've I've told the story before when I was a when I was a college student, I'd work summers at a lumber yard, loading trucks, unloading trucks, helping customers, this kind of thing. And I was only a summer worker, and I worked amongst most of the other people that worked there, worked there um, all year long. So they knew more about the business than I did. But, you know, I knew a few things. I worked there summer after summer. But invariably, when someone would walk into the yard, there'd be two or three of us together. Because I was the tallest of the individuals there, they would address me. And the other, I just sort of, I would just sort of laugh because I had heard that in psychology class in college that you know people sort of implicitly relate authority with height. And if you look at presidents since the television age, they're almost all over six foot. If you look at preachers, um, if you, generally speaking, I would say preachers are um, unusually tall in terms of the population. It's a very, very common thing because implicitly, deeply, we connect tall with authority. So there, there's, but that's not his point here. His point here is that words are tagged with um, positive or negative valence, positive or negative value. Is words can be marked or unmarked. Well, just quickly. So if I say to you, how tall is someone? That doesn't mean anything. But if I say, how short are they? That means they're short. The problem with the word constraint is it's a marked term, but you have to hear it. Okay, constraint has a negative value. And if you go back to the trigonometry, limitation has a negative value. We don't like that. We don't like this limitation. Now, why? As a Calvinist, I would say we don't like this limitation because it's part of the the sin in the garden that we don't like our va we don't like our limitation, and so we want to know both good and evil. Oh, do you really want to know evil? Absolutely. Because then we'll be like God. Okay, well, here's the fruit. Let's see where this goes. So we don't like limitations. We have aspirations to divinity where the stuff of earth and the breath of heaven, when we are filled with the breath of God, well, then we have aspirations to be God. I mean, this is just this gets into all sorts of long traditions in terms of in terms of good and evil. Now, our aspiration to be like God is a good thing, but again, as the story in the Garden of Eden demonstrates, we don't know what we're asking for often. Unmarked. You have to hear it the same way you hear tall. Okay? Okay, so what... Now, I wanted to bring in something... Some of you will remember Brett Anderson. He's been on my channel. I think he's been on John Verveke's channel. I think when I spoke with him, he was a graduate student, and he was really doing a deep dive into Jordan Peterson's work, into Maps of Meaning. Well, I think all of his work and his time has, has borne good fruit. He has now started a Substack. He has gotten on Twitter, and he is posting some. If you're interested in Jordan Peterson's work, Brett's work is super helpful because I think he is... He is simplifying this stuff and communicating this stuff. And the second of his, uh, the second of his substacks was called "The Illusion of Morality: Engaging with Frederick Nietzsche and Jonathan Haidt's Criticism of Morality." And he begins with Steven Pinker saying Pinker isn't reading Nietzsche correctly. Now, again, I'm not in a position to really evaluate his reading of Nietzsche, but what Anderson does with this, I think, is I think is helpful. Um, he talks about this question of morality being objective and subjective, and again, I'm not real, I'm not really big fans on on those terms. And he he defines objectivity, and that's that has a little bit of improvement, but I don't think it it quite goes all the way. Um, and then he's talking about Nietzsche. Why do we need to see morality as objective? Stanford 2018 answers, um, Stanford's 2018 answer to this question is very similar to Nietzsche's answer. I will quote Stanford at length here. It seems eminently plausible to suppose that among creatures who go for a cog cognitively complex form of representation at all, the most fundamental division embodied in their experience will be between representations of how things stand in the world itself. It's for the, like the cat is on the mat. That's objective, from which others cannot um, dissent without someone being wrong about something, and our subjective reaction to the states of the world, like pain or the desire for ice cream that are intrinsically motivated, but carry no such demand for intersubjective agreement. This fundamental division was surely the background phenomenological um, 
and conceptual framework into which moral norms, demands, considerations, and commitments have been shoehorned by the, con by the conservative um, tinkering process of evolution. And this is in turns explains why we find their curious hybrid characters so endlessly puzzling. Jonathan Haidt argues in his 2012 book, The Righteous Mind, morality works to bind people together. We cannot allow people to openly disagree about moral norms if they are to effectively serve this binding function. Stanford argues that if we want to discourage people from disagreeing about moral norms, we can't just see them as mere preferences. An effective strategy for discouraging disagreement is to treat moral norms as being essentially objective. We cannot disagree about whether the earth is flat without somebody being objectively wrong. Similarly, the pro-life, pro-choice advocates act as if we cannot disagree about the morality of abortion without someone being objectively wrong. As Nietzsche points out, cultures have a variety of strategies for making their moral values seem objective. For example, moral values can be made to seem objective by construing them as being woven into the fabric of reality, for example, karma, as being revealed to us by transcendent God, Christianity or Islam, or being deduced from reason, for example, Kant's categorical imperatives or, or Bentham's utilitarianism. Different groups have used different strategies to objectify their own morality, but every large group treats their moral norms as being objective in one way or another. Smaller pre-agricultural groups don't necessarily do this, but that's a story for another time. Now again, Nietzsche is coming at this from a modern skeptical perspective, and that's important in terms of reading this, and of course it's sort of a division between let's say someone who is deeply embedded in a Christian worldview where there are ways in which morality, and I actually had a lot of thoughts that I don't have time to go into in terms of God number one and God number two, the relationship between God number one and, and let's say ideas about karma, karma, sowing and reaping, sort of karmic consequence. If you carefully follow my sermons and especially the Sunday school class, which is paused for the summer, and I've been doing a lot of developing about this, God number one, God number two, law number one, law number two, and all of these kinds of things, but I don't have time to go into that so much in this um, in this video. Jonathan Haidt describes morality as a matrix, just like the Matrix movies. The illusion of objective morality bind, blinds people from seeing the truth. What is the truth that morality blinds us from seeing? The truth is that other people see their morality in just the same way you see your own as indisputable, righteous, and true, even when their morality is incompatible with yours. Moral matrices bind people together and blind them to the coherence, even the existence of other matrices. Now, this is an interesting point because on one hand, people theoretically get it, but emotionally they struggle with it. A lot of people do, and that fuels ongoing culture wars, debates within churches, disagreements between individuals. Um, you, And the point he's making is that people are not being duplicitous. They might be wrong. They might even be deceived, but they're not being duplicitous And when they assert their moral vision. They have a moral vision, and moral certain moral visions exclude fully being able to inhabit other moral visions. It's it's sort of like I'm in my office right now at the church, so I'm not at home. There's there's an exclusive, there's a constraint here, okay? And we're going to get more into the constraints as, as they go further into this conversation. Gosh, am I going to be able to get through this whole video? I don't know. I'm just going to have to talk faster. The strategies we use to construe our morality as, a, as objective end up blinding us from recognizing the coherence of the coherence, okay, of alternative moral frameworks. For example, if our transcendent God gave us a set of moral propositions to adhere to, then your incompatible moral propositions handed to you by your God must be false, and the heathen God who handed them over to you must be false as well. Basically, however, we go about construing our morality as objectively true. It necessarily rules out the possibility that other moralities can be true. Now, this is in some ways sort of a sophisticated way of just talking about belief. If I believe that I am wearing this plaid cotton shirt that I wear a lot, you see it on the videos a lot, I bought it at Costco, you know, I'm the kind of guy who buys his clothes at Costco. That's just who I am. Uh, there's a there's a constraint. There's a reality. That's just what this cotton shirt is. This isn't a silk shirt. This isn't a sweater. Um, this isn't uh, a pair of overalls. 
This is a this is a cotton shirt bought at Costco for a reasonable shirt at a reasonable price. Washes easily. Um, gonna wear it on the plane tonight. Bam. There it is. It just is. It's the cat on the mat. It's it's that kind of objective-ish thing. Morality has to have that quality in order for it to function. And in order for us to live in a world, we need... Now, John Verveig is going to say something really critical about morality a little bit later in this video. But we need to have a moral system. Without a moral system, we don't know how to act. And we have to act. And so we need a moral system. Even if it's not explicit, we, we still have one. Moral objectivity is the lie that Nietzsche wants to expose. Moral norms are not woven into the fabric of reality, he asserts. They are not imposed to us by a transcendent God. We cannot be, um, they cannot be deduced via reason. They are not objective in the way people generally think they are. In fact, systems of morality are products of cultural evolutionary process that take place over thousands of years. I think that's a little bit too upper register. Uh, I don't think, you know, I, I would disagree with that generally, but the point is a very important one. In fact, systems of morality are products of cultural evolutionary process that take place over thousands of years. This does give evolved moral systems some authority for the reason that all long-lasting traditions have some authority. I have to save, and that's he's going to pivot into more of Jordan Peterson's work, I have to save... Uh, full discussion of evolutionary cultural origins of morality for another time. However, why was Nietzsche so concerned about exposing the lie of objective morality? In large part, it's for the same reason that Jonathan Haidt is concerned with exposing it. Nietzsche is primarily concerned with uncovering the truth, whatever that truth may be, and he sees, as Jonathan Haidt has seen, that this kind of morality is antithetical to the honest pursuit of truth. Okay, now that's there, there's an interesting... There's an interesting conflict in there because one has to ask whether there can be truth if there is no, and again, I don't like the word objective, but there is no, there is no firm grounding to morality. I'll say it that way. That, that morality isn't something that we can just bend. Well, we can bend it, but there are consequences for it. And this gets into the idea again of constraints where they are going in this talk. If we are to create truly scientific communities focused on the pursuit of uh, the honest pursuit of truth, and again, I would I would say, yeah, that's not the only kind of truth. In fact, the the question the question is whether morality can be pursued scientifically, or the ki the type the kind moral truth is in fact scientific truth. It doesn't mean they live in separate domains. It doesn't mean they can't converse with each other. But and I think. But but science, science, scientific knowledge is a subset of far larger truths. And and every time we try to see all truth through the lens of science, we're going we're simply going to fail because science requires a reduction of things into far simple cause and effect relationships that are highly reliable and highly durable. But. There's so much complexity in human morality that, for the most part, morality can't be reduced and science can't be used on it. It's sort of like, you know, I just traveled thousands of miles over my last vacation. It's sort of like using a caliper and saying, I have to, I have to reduce my Canadian vacation to something that I can measure with a caliper. Now, first of all, it's completely a caliper would be the wrong tool even for measuring the amount of distance my car took but my canadian vacation can by no means be reduced simply to the number of miles i put on my car or kilometers there's so much more to the canadian vacation it can't be put into a caliper you know what a caliper is it's this, this little measuring tool that you know, you can measure very accurately, generally fairly small things, quite accurately. You cannot measure my Canadian vacation by a caliper. Now, morality amongst all human beings throughout all of history? No, no, no. That's the wrong, it's the wrong thing to try to do. Do, 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 do. How can we understand morality as a process without rendering it impotent? 
Uh, this is a big problem and one for which I don't think Nietzsche has an adequate solution. The problem is that we, for example, those who are those who have experienced moral nihilism, have discovered the shabby, non-objective origins of our moral values, and this makes the world seem meaningless. Now, I want to talk a little bit about meaning and constraint, because there's a deep connection between meaning and constraint. Why does Jordan Peterson have you dragging that heavy cross uphill? Where are the constraints? The constraints are on the weight of the cross. It's the splintery quality of the cross and the uphillness of the cross. Almost all of human meaning comes through constraint. So if you listen to, let's say, the critical drinker and his movie reviews, what's at the heart of almost all of his movie criticism is the use in storytelling and cinematography of removing constraint. Once CGI kind of came in, it's like, wow, we can dress people up in Oompa Loompa suits and put them behind a green screen and we can have absolutely no constraints. They can be they can be doing anything in any world right now. It can be Jurassic Park. It can be Star Wars. It can be Harry Potter. It can be any fandom you want. Just have to put them in an Oompa Loompa suit with those little bubbles and a green screen and boom, and you can you can have the same action be someone fighting in Lord of the Rings and someone fighting in Star Wars and someone fighting in Harry Potter. It's the absence of constraints makes things meaningless. This is the problem that Susan Wolf discussed in her great book, Meaning in Life. She argues that we experience meaning in life when we are subjectively attracted to something that is objectively attractive. Back to those words. The problem of modernity is, um, is that us modern people have a hard time seeing anything as being objectively attractive. And I think there's a connection there between that attraction and the morality because we see morality to a degree. I don't want to reduce it to instrumentality, but we do see morality as instrumentality in order to pursue an end. And that end is everything, meaning that end is God. But Nietzsche regarded this period of nihilism and meaninglessness as only a transitional stage to be um, eventually replaced by a new worldview that re-enchants the world without needing to involve the lie of objective morality. And, you know, this seems to be a failure at this point. The supreme value in which the service man should live especially when they are very hard on him and exacting a high price. These social values have erected over man to strengthen their voice as if they were commands of God, as reality, as a true world, as a hope and a future world. There's your telos. Now that was the shabby origin of these values is becoming clear. The universe seems to have lost value, seems meaningless, but that is only a transitional stage. Nietzsche will to power. It is my opinion that Jordan Peterson put forward a viable solution to this problem in his first book, Maps of Meaning. He conceptualized morality as a process without rendering it impotent while simultaneously re-enchanting the world in a scientifically coherent way. Peterson's project is not complete, however, which is why the book I am currently and slowly writing in a large part is an ex extension of his thesis of Maps of Meaning. But Maps of Meaning made a great deal of progress on this difficult problem. I wanted to connect some of these aspects here of constraint and meaning and morality because morality is, you know, I talk often about world saving and this kind of thing. Morality is all about seeking a better world, seeking a better me. It's all about transformations. And I think ultimately it's always all about seeking God. Now, again, you're going to have to understand God not as a super thing in the sky, but God as fully God number one and God number two. God as not simply the sum of all things, which would be pantheism, but the creator of all things. Um, and, and in that sense, the source of all things. All right, let's get back to the video. Because constraints are both selective and enabling. Evolution. Evolution need, needs natural selection, and it kills things off, and it winnows things down, yes, right? But it also has variation. These are enabling constraints. Limits not only 
right? And this is what I mean about- The death of the dinosaurs means the thriving of the mammals. But don't hearing, you have to hear the term un, in an unmarked way. They're not just constraining you, they're also affording you, right? So li language limits me. I'm a critique, I, I criticize this. Here. Propositions limit us, but language also enables me. I can talk about, you know, what, it, what, what might have happened if Africa had discovered steam power earlier than England. I can do that, and you can go, oh, oh, oh. and you can, can like language, I, Bertrand Russell once said, no matter how eloquently a dog barks, it can't tell you that its parents were poor but hardworking. So language both limits me in the negative sense, but it also affords me in the positive sense. And, 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 and so. So I'm going to return to the top of Brett Anderson's substack. The 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche famously um, referred to himself as an immoralist who was waging war on morality. In this post, I'm going to briefly explain why Nietzsche wanted to wage war on morality with reference to some, um, some modern literature that supports Nietzsche's claim. This war on morality led Steven Pinker in his 2018 book, Enlightenment Now, to claim that Nietzsche was advocating an egotistic psycho, um, psychopathy. Pinker claimed that Nietzsche argued it was good to be callous psychopath who cares not for the welfare of others. Nietzsche did no such thing. But it's easy to see how a careless and uncharitable reader might come away with this impression. Consider the following quote, which is one of Pinker uses to condemn Nietzsche. I do not point to evil and pain of existence with a finger of reproach, but rather entertain the hope that life may one day become more evil and more full of suffering than, than it has ever been. Nietzsche. If you take this at face value, you imagine that Nietzsche would love to see the world full of nothing but needless suffering and open malevolence. In fact, however, Nietzsche's point is that those things we consider evil and the sufferings associated with them are inseparable from everything we consider to be good and joyous, such that the attempt to eradicate evil and suffering is so often counterproductive. Nietzsche is advocating for the ancient wisdom which suggested that suffering is necessary for all that, for all that can be great. Nietzsche has rebelling against what he saw as the formation of a religion of pity in the European world. He was rebelling against the same ideology that Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukanoff wrote in their book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Jordan Peterson once referred to this ideology in relation to the mythical figure of the devouring mother, who believes her children weak, who keeps her children weak and dependent through excess of compassion. It's the same ideology that wants to give out participatory trophies and outlaw snowball fights at recess. If you, who adhere to this religion of pity, have the same attitude toward yourselves that you have toward your fellow men, if you refuse to let your own suffering lie upon you even for an hour, and if you constantly try to prevent and forestall all possible distress way ahead of time, if you experience suffering and displeasure as evil, hateful, worthy of annihilation as a defective existence, then it is clear that besides your religion of pity, you also harbor another religion of your heart that is perhaps the mother of all religion of pity, the religion of comfortableness. How little you know of human happiness. You, you comfortable and benevolent people for happiness and unhappiness are sisters and even twins that either grow up together or, as in your case, remain small together. Nietzsche, The Gay Science 338. It is easy for an uncharitable reader like Pinker to cherry-pick quotations in order to make Nietzsche out to be something he's not. Something similar can be said about Nietzsche's comment on morality. On the surface, he attacks the morality might be taken as a means of anything goes or supporting a, a policy of egotistic psychopathy as Pinker accuses him of doing. This is wrong. Nietzsche did not want people to go around murdering, stealing, raping, and committing other acts we might consider immoral. Rather, Nietzsche wanted to change how we think and feel about morality. I talked about that a little bit earlier. He wanted us to be more realistic about it. It goes without saying that I do not deny, unless I am a fool, that many actions called immoral ought to be avoided and resisted, or that many, many called moral ought to be done and encouraged. But I think the one should be encouraged and the other avoided for other reasons than hitherto. We have to learn to think differently in order, to, in order at last, perhaps very late on, to attain even more, to feel differently. Basically, what he's saying is that you don't arrive at anything worthwhile without suffering. And back to this conversation with Verveke, you don't actually achieve anything worthwhile, anything meaningful without constraint. Constraint is essential for meaning, and if you don't have meaning, you're going to have a meaning crisis, and then you just f 
slough off into nihilism. So absolute, absolute freedom and an absolute removal of all, it will all become completely self-determining. But do you, that, does that mean you think the self is a bound, limited thing? No, the self is completely, and it's like, what do you mean by self-determination if there's no limiting, if there's no... No self you know or is worthwhile knowing among human beings is not without constraint. In fact, some of the greatest saints I know have become saints because they were constrained. You know, coherent notion of what a self is, it just becomes this, it's what my hands are doing. And, 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 and it's like, why? You need to give me an overwhelmingly convincing argument why I should care about that at all. And so for me, them, they're putting their finger on the fact that, right, we, we have, for me, I mean, at one point we should talk about what was good about Gnosticism. I, you know, the Gnosticism is trying to address when people feel sort of existentially trapped, existentially ignorant, inertia, right? There, there's a reason why we have Gnosticism. There's a reason why that term was in the ancient literature. But putting that aside, right, there's an important thing there, right? You know, now, listening to what he just said about Gnosticism, it does make me think that in this, in this period of reductive materialism that says reality is merely the lower register, you can understand you have an overcompensation towards the Gnostic, where it's the denial of the lower register and the complete um, pursuit of the upper register, but it's detached from the lower register, so it just flies up and away. That's Gnosticism, okay? And it comes when you have bondage simply to the lower register, which is basically what reductive materialism asserted. And it's part of the reason it went, it went meaningless. Idea of freedom, like even in, like you should always ask freedom from and freedom to. Yes, okay, I wanna be, I wanna be free from the limits of my body. Free to, free to do what? And, and tell me something that you love to do that doesn't involve your body. I, 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 don't, I don't know what that means, right? Well, I, I, and so what are you being free to do? And for me, the free to is actually what I was, mean, mean, I mean, I'm free to actually lose my freedom in love. I'm, I, like, I, I, I wanna love the truth. Frankfurt calls it a voluntary necessity. I wanna love the truth, I wanna love what's good, I wanna love what's beautiful. And, and, and finally, just, just, just on this, I want to get free from, like, the, like, your body, this is part of the guts of relevance realization. Your body is not Cartesian clay, right? Your body is an autopoetic, it's a self-making system, and it, it, because it is making itself, it is constantly taking care of itself, and therefore it's constantly caring about itself, and that's why you can care about this information rather than that information, rather than a computer. Relevance realization is dependent on the fact that you're embodied. Your bioeconomy, the cost functions, is what actually prevents you from trying to look at everything and think of everything. In other words, life is dependent upon constraint. Take that limitation away and you hit combinatorial explosion. Because here's the thing, you think you're going to open up your limits and reality is just going to be there, stable for you. You open up those limits and reality will say, watch what I can do. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's doing. Exactly. And, and so to apply some of the combinatorial explosiveness, okay, so I've talked about here I am in my messy office. That hope after all of my traveling this spring and this fall to, I'm going to empty it, I'm going to get out this carpet, I'm going to... There's more reality in this office. If I were even to catalog, I could exhaust whatever years I have of my life simply cataloging what is in this office, and someone would say, that is a meaningless, pointless thing to do. Why? Because you don't need to catalog what's in your office. Why? Well, how, how do we know this? Well, there's a better question. How on earth do we know this? Maybe I could find it fulfilling to catalog every every bit of atomic matter that is in my office, its location, its valence, but it has to be at a particular time because those electrons are, of course, swirling around and on and on and on and on and on. No, that's constraint is in many ways fundamental to our existence. And without it, there is no caring. <laughs> Don't you think that possibly, I think one of the friends that I try to see it through is the, the frame of, of desire. It seems to be there's something that happened 
it, it's related to consumer culture, it's related to the 60s, it's related yeah. to a strange inversion. From now, now, I want to be a little careful with desire here because what John just finished talking about, in fact, was desire. And it was good desire. And the language of the New Testament is a little bit more nuanced than what we have available to us in English. Because in 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 Greek you have thumia, which is just sort of generic desire. And the New Testament, Paul, when Paul uses desire in the way that Jonathan's using it right now, tends to use epithumia. Now epi is an over. It's one of these Greek uh, prepositions. It's over desire. Um, it's the the desire of control. An epithumia with respect to my relationship with my messy office would be to spend the rest of my lifelong days ignoring my family, ignoring my church, ignoring all of the responsibilities, ignoring all the pleasures available to me would be an epithumia to catalog the. Um, to make a to make a thoroughgoing atomic map of my messy office, that would be an epithumia. Now you would look at that's a ridiculous epithumia, but that's what's at the heart of let's say reciprocal narrowing and addiction. And an addiction, you know, what what do I want? I want meth. I want alcohol. Um, I I was driving home with my wife the other day, and I saw a guy passed out next to a house it was just laying there i thought maybe a medical emergency my wife didn't see it i stopped the car I said, why are you stopping the car so there's a guy over there and she jumped out to go and attend i said no let he's a man let me attend to him she said okay i'll go to the door and see if somebody's home and so i go to the guy and i shake him and he kind of wakes up and then i see that there's a couple of beer cans strewn around him and he looks at me first like what are you what are you doing what are you doing here and i said are you okay and it took him a minute, and, and then it be, he began, I said, I saw you laying here, and you appeared unconscious, and I want to make sure you're okay. And so then he, he actually bumped into him a few days after that, and he shook my hand, and he thanked me for it, but there was alcohol on his breath when he met me in the street, too, and we had a, another little conversation. My wife went to the door of the house. The young man I looked at was probably in his early 30s, my wife went to the door of the house, rang the doorbell. An older woman came out, probably in her um, her early 60s, came out, saw my wife, trying to you know figure out, and then came around the corner, saw her son was, oh. And you could just look at the look on her face. And it's the look on her face, I've seen it plenty. It was the mother of an alcoholic. Like, not only, not only do I have to live with the fact that my son is an alcoholic and I am housing him, and I have to live with his alcoholic self. But now I've been embarrassed because he's passed out on the front yard and total strangers and all of their well-meaningness have come and exposed the wretched state of our experience together. Well, there's a, there's a desire, there's an epithumia, there's an over-desire that has taken over this man's life. You might say, well, I wish I could drink all I wanted to and, well... If you could drink all you wanted to, you wouldn't drink because you can drink all the water you want to. In fact, the power that alcohol has, which you seek, is in fact itself a constraint because what alcohol does is it constrains your world. You know, drugs are either, they're either uppers or downers. Alcohol is a downer. So you're constrained your world and you numb your world and pain that's inside or pain that's outside, it numbs you. So... You, you drink alcohol because of its constraint. I wish I could just drink and drink and drink and there'd be no constraint. Well, why don't you drink water? Well, water doesn't do the same thing to me. Ah, there it is. From virtue into desire. Mm -hmm. So virtue there, into value. Sorry. So we replaced talking about what people's virtues are with, with what they value. Right. Yes, in that sense. Yes, yes. In that sense of what they, what they think has value to them, let's yes, say, at least yes. personally. And... And then, so I think that, that there's something related to that. And then what happens, and we know it from every tra tradition in the entire world, is that if you turn your eye, so it's like there's nothing wrong with desire, but it's like if you turn your eye towards desire, then it explodes. It's like... And, and again, I'd want to nuance that a little bit. It's, there's, like you said, there's nothing wrong with desire. That's through me. It's, we, we are made to desire. And in fact, we're made to desire everything. 
Augustine, of course, says, um, nothing can satisfy one who would not be satisfied with God. We are made to desire everything, but we have to put our desires in order. And then, in fact, you can enjoy all of the lower desires because they don't become governing desires. They don't become epithumias. It's, an, it's indefinite. It's insatiable, exactly. Yeah. And if you enter into that space, and you enter into it in terms of consumer culture or in terms of all the, even in terms of like the hippie, you know, like the free love or whatever, like we just can do, we can have as much pleasure as we want. It's insane. And, and of course, love is an interesting one to get into with respect to constraint. It's like, well, my marriage constrains me because I'm only supposed to have uh, sexual relations with one woman. Well, wouldn't I like to have sexual relations with other women? Well, of course. I mean, novelty, men and novelty and sexual activity. Yeah, well, I, okay, so so let's uh, take off the restraint and we'll have an open marriage. Oh, but where will that lead? Well, why, why would my wife, you know, get, go home today, honey, let's have an open marriage. She says, you can have an open marriage by yourself. <laughs> I ain't having it. Um, okay, sweetheart. And, and then suddenly I have to choose. Do I want the constraint of a marital relationship or do I want sexual liberty. Well, what do I get with sexual liberty? All of these bids, however, lead to, well, so then you, you know, why is sex so sticky, as they said in the Oneida community? Um, why is sex so sticky? Well, it binds you to this other person. Well, you want to have, you want to possess them. And well, well we're, we're no longer going to sort of possess them wholly. Oh, you could just, you, you just, I, I don't have to, I don't have to, walk this all and maybe some of you do need it walked out but now is not the time and the place in other words the power of a marriage is the constraint of the marriage well why why is it so binding well my children need it to be binding because if they've got to deal with mom and all of dad's girlfriends what are the standings of all of dad's girlfriends well what does that matter well all of dad's girlfriends have pieces of dad's heart and if you have to deal with dad and you have to deal with all his girlfriends and you have to deal with your mom, you've got a far more complex situation here. And children, they don't have all the time in the world to deal with dad and all of his girlfriends or mom and all of her boyfriends. They've got a lot of things to do in their short little lives. And to have a reliable father and a reliable mother and a reliable relationship, not perfect by any means, but a reliable relationship means they can begin to focus on the rest of human existence that they need to get onto instead of always being trapped and tripped up by dad and all of his girlfriends or mom and all of her boyfriends or both and. And all over what? Fruitless sex? There's no limit to it. Yes. And so, it, and then it moves towards idiosyncratic desires, right? So you can see that in the sexual. Talk to Jonathan again. I'm going to have to talk to him about his use of the word idiosyncratic. It's a, it's a rather ins idiosyncratic use of the word, and I'm I'm not always exactly sure what he means by it. It's fetishizations where it's like all these little sexual desires start to like appear all these weird little pornographic sexual desires start to manifest themselves like actually appear in the world and you kind of they kind of multiply and multiply and multiply yeah and so there's no limit and so it's a, it's about desire and power and so well and when there's no limit then it becomes meaningless and people who have had a lot of sexual partners less constraint, less meaning. So what the machine has always been, the machine from the beginning is always about increasing power. That's what all civilizations do, right? So the civilization apparatus itself is about increasing power. Now, if we- And I'd want to nuance, gosh, I'm not gonna have anywhere near enough time to get through this whole thing. And there's a lot of good stuff at the end I want to get to. I've been also doing a lot of thinking about the relationship between the machine and, and what Peugeot talks about in terms of uh, garments of skin. The, the machine wishes in many ways to alleviate constraint. So much of our technology, well, let's say contraception. Contraception, a constraint on sexual activity is the consequence of sexual activity, which is pregnancy, okay? Alleviate the constraint. 
uh, alleviate the constraint of the distance between here and the Canadian Rockies. Well, I've done that with a car. Alleviate the constraint between here and the Midwest or the East Coast, which I will certainly do tonight with an airplane. These aren't bad things. Garments of skin alleviate the constraint of all sorts of things. Um, uh, cold weather, um, bite, arrows, stones, um, vulnerability, nakedness. I mean, all of these technologies do this, but they always come at a cost. And, well, the continued pursuit of technology tries to continue to reduce the cost. So the cost of the automobile is the uh, tinkering with, Jordan Peterson has this great speech about it, tinkers with the um, chemistry of the atmosphere, it tinkers with um, this, the, the shape of the city, it tinkers with animals, uh, it tinkers with the creation of roads and then animal. I mean, the automobile is this enormously complex thing that changes the world in order for me to be able to visit the Canadian Rockies. The airplane is this thing that changes the world in order for me to visit my family in the Midwest and the East Coast. You do it in with your eye towards desire then it will lead to, it leads to something like the metaverse because your desires are idiosyncratic you cannot be a horse but if you live in the metaverse you can be a horse today or for five minutes if you want and then you can switch to doing something else and and, and and so okay so i desire to be a horse uh do i desire to what, what, what is involved in my desire to be a horse? Is it to live outside? Is it to poop in the field? Is it to eat grass? Is it to um, never be able to get on an airplane? Is it to never um, um, relate to my children and hug my children? Because a horse can't hug. A horse can kind of come up and a human can hug a horse, but a horse can't hug a, hug a human. Now somebody in this comment section is going to say, yeah, but a horse can nuzzle it because you all know horses better than I do. But you get my point. If you want hoarseness, you're going to have to embrace the constraints of hoarseness. No, but I want to transform into a horse. Do you really? Um, Edmund, of course. Is it Ed? No, it's not Edmund. It's, um, I forget which of the uh, Eustace. I believe it's Eustace. You know, is transformed into a dragon, which at first he thinks, well, this is cool. Then suddenly he realizes all the constraints that he has, even being a dragon, which is sort of this poly creature that both breathes fire and has scales and has wings and has claws and has sharp teeth and and is intelligent and you're like wow a dragon would be a great thing to be well you're not going to I had a dream dream the other night dreamed one of my kids was small again i just picked up that child and held that child in my dream and you know all those memories i had of holding my I mean, I can, I can my, in my mind's eye, still sort of see all of my children and hold them because they felt a certain way. A dragon can't hold a child like I held my children. So, but again, these are these are all these constraints, and and the joy of them. And okay, in a virtual world, well, now I'm a dragon. Not you're not really a horse. This this gets into the whole transgender thing. Whoop, I'm a woman. You're not really a woman. You haven't lived with the constraints of womanhood your whole life. And so you really don't qualify as a woman. Well, I'm a man. You're not really a man. You haven't lived with the constraints and the challenges of being a man. Now, are you something else? Well, probably. But these are the, you know, this is what we're talking about. You can, so you can just like cycle the craziest desires like one after the other and live in this whirlwind of, of, of desire and like uh, of like impermanent identities that just keep flipping from one to the other and thinking that that's what will satisfy you and it will never satisfy you. So I think that there's something about where are they meeting? It's an interesting place where they're meeting. Th this this kind of narcissism which has to do with that. It's actually it's actually like the. It's the, it's, let's say. Well, and again, the virtuality is like Gnosticism in that it's, it's, it's devoid from the material and it's just kind of floating up there. Even the end of the very idea of technology itself, technology as the notion of increasing of power to do things. Mm -hmm. but it's, and the removal of constraints and limitations.
they're not, it's not bad in itself. It can be turned towards a good. Yep. But technology always has a danger because it is an increase of power, that if it's not balanced with wisdom, then it will, it will turn towards. And what we've seen in the, in the modern age is exactly that, that move, where we've, we've discarded wisdom slowly, we've seen the great power that this te technological understanding affords us, and we just are throwing ourselves into it. And so it, there's a, the, the correlation between the obsessions and desires and, and slavery to desires and this increasing technocratic, technological world that, that makes you think that you'll be able to escape all limitations to your desires is completely coherent. Like it, it's, it seems that it's, it makes sense that it's happening this way. Okay. And, the, and so the change, it cannot be a technological change. No, no, I, the I, change I, has no. to be a change of worldview, basically. Yes, yes. And so, first of all, that, that's excellent. Um, and, you know, um, so I think there's a deep connection uh, between the, the notions of freedom and the notions of power, and that both of them are being... Uh, transformed into absolute goods rather than instrumental goods. Mm. I didn't say freedom wasn't good. No. I didn't say power wasn't good. I said they're instrumental goods. They're not inherent goods, right? Whereas virtue is about trying to be in right relationship with that that is inherently good, right? Inherently real, inherently et cetera, right? So I agree that it, it, it's, it's that. Um, I suppose what I would want to say is what you just said at the end. Um, like part about the talk about the machine in the cathedral is, um, I want to I want to I want to slow down that, mm -hmm. because you invoked a different term that I think is more appropriate. It, um, which it's is, very helpful now. I haven't rewatched the old one. I don't know where the machine in the cathedral comes in. I think that, is that a pairing in his? Was that in the conversation? I'm not sure, but again, it's important to remember that cathedrals were at the the bleeding edge of technology for their day too. So again, let's not make technology evil. A cathedral is an enormous implementation of technology in many, many different levels. Architectural technology, um, glass making, um, you know, all the things that go into making a cathedral. So it's helpful to, to, to keep that in mind. Is worldview. Um, and I think worldviews are absolutely... It, it is amazing to me how, of course, worldview, this was, a, this was a word that I don't know who started talking about it. I don't know if it comes out of the reform tradition or not. But this is a very old, I mean, reformed, Dutch reformed people have been talking about worldview all of my life. And so to watch it come up in this conversation in this way, I'll have to do a little bit of research into who first started talking about worldview. I don't know if it's the Dutch reformed, but I, I'm sure we've certainly been talking, using that word for a long, long time. Necessary for... Um, relevance realization, and I think they have to continually evolve. Also, what, now what I'm so the thing about we all face the paradox of communication and cooperation. What, what I, this is from Montague. What I mean by that? Okay, so if you and I don't communicate, we'll work at cross purposes, and that will actually undermine. We'll waste our lives to some degree, right? But if we just talk, we'll also waste our lives, right? And so, well, what do you do? Well, one of the things you can do is, you can, let's use an analogy. The brain does this, and the, so imagine a, a happily married couple, and they've been married for a long time, okay? And they almost have telepathy, right? And so, it, now why is that? Because the husband, I'll, 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 just for ease, I'll, I'll, it's ease of conversation, I'll presume they're a heterodox, uh, sorry, not heterodox, hetero, heterosexual couple. Um, um, and, right, the husband has internalized a model of his wife and given it considerable space in his psyche, and so he can consult that model when he's not with her, and she can consult her model because she's internalized him, and they can both act in a coordinated fashion without having to spend that much time talking to each other, right? 
Now the thing is, we can't, we, and this is what we do with friendships, and, but we can't do that with sort of, so what we do, and this is me. We can't do that with everything. This idea is we create, think about a baseball team. All right, this is Mead's example. What I do is I create, I internalize not you or you. I, I do that a little bit, but I'll internalize the generalized other. What, what anybody else on the team would do. It's called the generalized other. And then I can consult that model, and then I can play well with a whole bunch of people. And then you take that up a notch. What a worldview is, it's, it, it's, a, it's a generalized agent, what, it, what, what any agent is in our, in our group, and this is the arena for our group so that we can coordinate without you and I and all having to talk directly to each other in depth. There, that's irreplaceable. You can't, you can't, I'm gonna dispense with world views. Do, do you understand? Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right? And, and, and you have to, so, but notice if the couple never talk, it's a disaster. And if they talk too much, that means something's probably going wrong. They have to cycle between it, right? And so the world view has to cycle between you, you accept it, and then you might revise it, and then you, it has to evolve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I put to you that one of the functions, not the only, one of the, and this is derived from Goethe's idea, one of the function of religion was exactly that, to, 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 to create. I, I think this is a super helpful point. Participate and, and, and curate a worldview for people. Yeah, I agree. A, a religion in many ways is your model of the world. And it's a model that's community sourced and communally sourced and ancestrally sourced. And this is, this is where Peterson talks about ideologies as crippled religions. They're, they haven't lived long enough. They haven't been community sourced. There's been significant warpings. And there's plenty of tragedy and warpings and trial and error that go on in the, in the emergence of religions, let's say. But no, religions are vast models through which we that we use to see the world because, of course, we, we simply can't walk in and take anything afresh. Let's say you walk into a room that you've never been in before. Um, so friends of mine, they like doing these escape rooms, and I've, I've never done one. But um, the, the point of an escape room is you have to quickly learn the room and you have to learn the routines of the room. But you're, you're using all of this prior knowledge and bring it to bear in order to achieve the certain outcome. Worldviews and, and, and religions are this vast repository of knowledge that you inherit. And it's, it's, this is this model that you internalize and then you bring that out into the world. I think it's a really helpful definition of a religion. Right. So part of my worry about the, the, the criticism of the machine and, right, and, and the cathedral is, yeah, that's right, we do have these hyper objects and they do exercise a kind of hyper agency, but we need them, yes. right? We can't do without worldviews. We can't do without. So now, in the Dutch Reformed, Partly, I think, because of what happened to the world religion in the secular space. I think that's why in the Dutch Reformed, even when I was in grade school going to the um, Christian Reformed day schools, worldview substituted for religion because religion was, was a word that was um, problematized, let's say, although we didn't use that word back then. And so we used worldview. And it's interesting that he's using it exactly the same way here in this conversation. Again, I, I, I was worried about there being a crypto Gnosticism under the critique of Gnosticism, which is, let's get free of world views. And it's like, no, that's not, you can't do that because you won't be able to run, a, a, you know, a civilization. Yeah, but I think it, knowing Paul and, and having talked to him several times and listening to the conversation, I, I was, I think. Well, I think this is exactly why Paul became orthodox. <laughs> because he realized he needed a system. And so here's a system, and, and that system, he found a fittedness with the other aspects of his, um, his, his anti-machinism. He found a fittedness in orthodoxy, which again makes perfect sense given sort of where orthodoxy lies on the mappings of Christian traditions. That what he's saying is that there's something about you know him better than I yeah. do. So I'll admit he, that, yeah. He, he says there's something about, let's say, what you could call something like the, the traditional worldviews, yeah. which have this, this organic embedded structure 
of, 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 of relationships and hierarchies that, that are... Tra traditional religions are very well worked through, mapped, battle-tested worldviews. It doesn't mean they're perfect, but it means that they are probably far and ahead beyond so much of the other. Now, there's the Brett Weinstein critique lurking in the background that says, yeah, but are they updated? And yeah, the, 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 here's, yeah, this is a Protestant talking here. And it's like, yeah, updating is important. You know, they develop forever and they're just kind of, they're, that's what they are. That's how they work. And that, and that this has, it has ritualization, there's things we celebrate, you know, all of these things are, are part of it. Um, and that this has been replaced or there's been a, a move to replace it by what, what he calls machine. the machine. And this, and this machine is, a, is like a parody Right, of these more organic integrated systems. All right, the machines are in some ways that way analogous to what Peterson says as ideologies, they're crippled religions. And, and it, it has to have some aspect of, of it or else they couldn't exist, right? Exactly, so exactly, so, so exactly. It, it's taking some aspects of how identity functions and it's radicalizing in some ways. And you can see it because one of the things that they talk about is freedom, it's hilarious because I totally agree with them. But we also have to remember that, that the, the freedom that they talk about this like this reduction, this reducing of all constraints on reality, has to exist in exact balance with the most control that you've ever experienced in your entire life. More control than any any society has ever been able yes. to 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 impose on anyone. Yes. And so those two things strangely coexist together. You can see it's a radicalization of a normal relationship let's say, of something like freedom and authority, which right. would, would just kind of organically uh, manifest itself in a normal, not sometimes me in a messy way and sometimes in a violent way, but would, would, would work itself out. Whereas now what we've got is, in order to go, in order to access the metaverse and to have access to absolute freedom to do whatever you want, you have to give up every single aspect of yourself to this machine. You have to be completely submitted to it. You have to see, you know, everything about you is going to be owned by this thing, and there's no way out of it. And so it's like, it's, a, it's, it's 1984 and, and Brave New World at the same time. Like, who thought that this was possible? But it seems like that's what we're kind of seeing on the horizon, where it's like, it's absolute control, and, but one that is bad. Well, well, it's interesting that it's both, because, of course, both of those visions grew out. So there's probably something in, in Orwell and Huxley that, that saw them coming, and so... Again, we, we look, our, our view of such things is so reductive and simplistic that combinatorial explosiveness almost means that the world will always be far more complex than our simple mappings can account for. Balance out weirdly with this. Okay, this is excellent. This is tremendously helpful. And thank you for, um, for, uh, for speaking on his behalf because he's not here yeah. to speak for him. So, so. There's now an issue, uh, an issue of almost finesse or virtuosity or nuance, because you can't you can't be critical of the self-organizing having a life of its own aspect of this thing right. because that's how it functions, right? So that can't well, be. What yeah, you're I think th the reason why they're doing you can't be critical. You also can't be skeptical. To have that aspect of the conversation is because one of the problems that we're seeing in this this type of discussion is that when you point out to the machine people will say that's not possible because it requires a conspiracy Again, a complete yeah, centralized yeah, conspiracy yeah. and therefore what you're saying is false and what Paul's trying to say no what I'm saying doesn't require that yes. I can sh these yes. self these self-organizing systems exist this is one of them it's it's excessive it's it's parasitic and so, and I can describe it and say that it exists without, and you can't accuse me of saying it can't exist because it would require this insane, like absolute top-down hierarchy to, 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 to be co co communicating all I the I think that argument is very well placed, and thank you for bringing it up. Like the, 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 one of the things, and you and I have talked about this, right? right? One, of, one, of the, one of the damages of conspirituality is, is its inability to see Hyper objects and see hyper objects as self organizing entities that can, can have a collective intelligence and kind of a collective agency. And that's one of the big, that's one of the, 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 the really worrying 
um, kinds of blindness that that can do. And so I think that argument is well placed. What, but what, let me try. Now I'm just finishing The Twilight of the Gods, this Ian Toll trilogy on the Pacific War. And, and one of the things that I've seen through the reading of that book has been, I don't like the term hyper object, I want another term, but the what possessed Japan, you know, Admiral Perry comes in, it just shocks Japan that this terror that we're way behind the world. It's like when you play civilization and you're kind of working on your island and you're kind of living in this. And then suddenly you meet another civilization. Of, They've got ironclads and I'm still rowing in galleys. I'm in real trouble. Yeah, you are. And so then what possessed Japan, the Meiji Restoration, and it's fascinating how this then worked itself out in what happened in the Japanese, the Imperial Japanese Empire and their attempt to conquer China and all that came out in the Pacific War. And then at the end, after... Japan finally, and, and it's even amazing how tenuous their ability to surrender was, even though they were just completely being devastated, even after two nuclear bombs, after the Russians joined the war, all of this stuff. They could barely get to the point of surrendering, and then finally the Americans come and occupy. And some of these sections about occupation, I don't have time to play those videos now, but they're towards the end of the book. They're really quite moving. I mean, the occupation went just amazingly well thanks both sort of to American culture and Japanese culture of the people, there's a furious, you know, the, the, then suddenly the people realized that they had been duped because they had had all this propaganda that the Americans were going to come and they were going to brutalize and they're going to rape and they're going to do all this. And then the American military came and they weren't abusive at all. Of course, there were instances and cases, but they weren't abusive at all. And suddenly the Japanese are like, we were, we were completely fooled by our leaders and, it, it gets into how we we need these systems, but how they can go so terribly wrong. Try what, what, what I'm trying to say is, like the, 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 like this is well, it's running on its own, and you're right. That needs people need, but that that's not it's that's not what's wrong with it. No, right, no, right, no, right, right. And so what the, I, the the Meiji Restoration and Imperial Japan and the military they're running on their own. The 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 top brass want to start. You know they're they're trying not to. I mean, just starting the war with the United States was the beginning of their destruction. But the the second level officers just kind of kept pushing and promoting them into it, and it was a runaway train. I think is not being said. That, they're tr that needs to be said is that they're trying, I'm going to say this very carefully, and you, you know Paul better than I do, you both know their work better than I do, so I may be speaking out of ignorance, so I'll just caveat that. But I think they're trying to find a metaphysical location for evil. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get, so what happens in the Enlightenment is we, we lose sin and we lose evil and we replace it with immorality. That, what he said right there, is so important. What happened in the Enlightenment is we lose sin and we lose evil and we replace it with immorality. And why is that? Because the Enlightenment is about the gods aren't in control, we're in control. There are no beings higher than us. That means that there are no hyper objects. That means that, you know, all of the actors in, the, in Imperial Japan were responsible. Yes. But there was something that developed in that culture at that time that 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 grew beyond. It wasn't yes, that, and that doesn't absolve any of them resp from responsibility. It's both and. Yet there's a moreness that happens, and this reduction of let's have them say it again is we patient for evil. They're trying to get, so what happens in the Enlightenment is we, we lose sin and we lose evil and we replace it with immorality. We lose sin and we lose evil and replace it with immorality. And then that goes back to Nietzsche because, well, sin and evil are much more, in a sense, objective than 
morality. So we have to we have to up the stakes on morality and make it more and more objective, which implicitly raises our responsibility. Now, now, now we, it, we're even difficulty. What what is our responsibility? I mean, my responsibility now. You know, an individualism is going to grow in this thing too. So this is a critical moment right here. Right. Now there was there's great advantages to that. There's there's a lot gained, but again there was something lost, which is we actually don't right we like we 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 can't understand evil because we've reduced it to morality and we've reduced morality to individual choice because we can't understand evil because we've reduced it to immorality and we've reduced immorality to individual choice and this is exactly what we're getting at in terms of this this Nietzsche conversation that. Evil is is objective in that sense. It's there's an ex, it has an existence or or a strange. And you're going to get into Neoplatonism a little bit. A strange um, shadow nothingness existence to it. That you know, evil is is sort of the deprivation of of being. But 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 there it has it has it has an ontological value. Maybe that's a better way to say it. As we, you know, that we, Kantian ethics, yeah. autonomy of it, right? So, what I'm trying to, so they're they're trying to say something like. They want. I think what they would like to say is, you know, the machine is evil. Yeah, but I, but I think that they, they I think so. When I listen to them, and I don't know if they would say this. I, I, I think they would say evil is using the machine. And the machine has a quality of evil to it. And this gets into, I can recommend Neil Planting as not the way it's supposed to be, a breviary of sin. The sin is this very strange thing that is always sort of at our door. You know, in Cain and Abel, you know, sin is crouching at your door and it wishes to have you. Um, but what I get from them, and this is maybe filtered through my own yeah. symbolic lens or whatever, is to say something like, what I see is the desire to instrumentalize all things towards desire. They won't say desire, they say freedom. But like, I yeah. prefer the desire part because I think it's closer to a whole historical development. Well, freedom is understood as freedom from restraint on desire. Exactly, there you go. Okay. And so, so what they're saying is that you're trying to instrumentalize things in the name of this and I we, we want our freedom in order to pursue our desires and and even to allow them to become over desires epithumia I think that that's e that's evil that's a good definition of evil okay. evil is instrument instrumentalization of things towards my own self okay self this, desire okay but this is the part that's missing from their work right. the conversation we're having right now which is this needs to be a discussion about but it's not, there's no, there's no reason to sort of, ah, because it's self-organizing. The difficulty you're going to have in this, of course, as Jonathan's about to point out in a few minutes, is that once you start talking about evil and sin in a secular frame, people can say, oh, religion, nope, 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 not going there, doesn't belong in the public space. Or because it's distributed cognition, or because it's a hyper object, or because it takes on a life of its own. It's what, what they basically want to say is that's evil. Yeah. And, and it's evil that's, uh, that's not the same as the immorality of individual choice and behavior. It's got a life of its own. Yeah. That, the ancient notion of evil was that it was something beyond immoral behavior. Yeah. It, had, it had a non-existence, you know what I mean yeah, when yeah, I'm yeah. doing it. It has, a, it has a reality independent of human being. This is Augustine's great, he claims his great discovery, mm -hmm. right? That there's something pulling him down that's not his choice, yeah. but it somehow infects his choice and makes him believe it, it's his choice, right? And, and then he tries with original sin, and we won't get into the, the theology. But the, 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 the insight there is that we want to say, no, no, there's something beyond, there's something else that goes on yeah. beyond immoral. Like you, you, you can see, you can see Arendt wrestling this with, the, with like when she. Something is at work within me. This is Paul in the Book of Romans. Eichmann and the banality of evil. Like, like why is this guy so banal? And, and Paul and Romans talking about, and of course Augustine will, will pick up on this, that the law, 
which is something that is given for good, for the good of Israel, the covenant law given to Israel so that Israel can uh, be a priest to the nations. Just preached about this last Sunday. Israel can be a priest to the nations, the law. And then Paul turns around and says, but this law, evil takes this law and does something with it and turns turns the law against me. He's making these banal individuals, they're immoral, but they're banal. How do we get the titanic evil of the Nazis from a bunch of people acting immorally? Like, like she's really, that, that's how I, I'm reading her. She's re you see what I'm trying no, to say? No, I totally agree. I, but I think that there's a, I think that the, the narrative, if you look at, the, the people can't, I understand, people don't understand the narrative, and they've been ruined by science fiction and, and movies where they see like demons with wings that are with swords and fighting. <laughs> and so, but that's the whole demonology, that's what demonology is. Right, demonology is to understand that evil is transpersonal. It, it, has, it has a kind of parasitic intelligence yes. and that you can recognize it, you can name it, and you can see the pattern and you can notice when it embodies itself. And then you can see that from... One of the things I remember from my little YouTube journey is my conversation with James Lindsay when he used the word demonic. And I thought, that's the word you're using what what are you opening the door to in terms of your atheism once you open that door and you have to open it in terms of you have to recognize that there is evil at play now suddenly you are not you are no longer buffered from god most of us, sometimes, most of us will, will, let's say, give up to some demon sometimes. Like, I get angry, I do this, I do that. But then sometimes, some people get completely taken over by something, a, a parasitic uh, uh, pattern that they, that they become completely uh, taken over by, and then they're possessed. They're, they're possessed by the demon of anger, and that this is something that that happens. I think that that's what demonology is. And if, I mean, I understand people would be hesitant to bring back demonology because it has so many weird uh, connotations. But if we can understand it properly, we can see that it is this idea that d there are these patterns that are intelligent and that... It, it's the demonology in that sense is sort of the, the mythos of evil played out in the in, in the available characters of a particular culture. Our eight have a gen agency and that you can recognize them and that, like you said, it's not, it doesn't, necessi it doesn't ne necessitate conscious actors yeah. all through no. the way that they embody themselves. It doesn't at all. Yes. But you can still see the structure and you can still see it embodying itself. So, so yeah, I mean, we've had another discussion about this. You know, we've had two and I, I the idea of, uh, you know, distributed cognition, uh, collective intelligence, and that I, I think the evidence for this is overwhelming. And, you know, uh, Dan Chappie and I published papers on that and, you know, uh, uh, shared agency and, uh, and, and I, so I think, I think we're, we're, what I'm saying is we're, because we're breaking out of the individualistic model of cognition, we are now cr maybe groping or at least moving towards an ontology in which we can now relocate what we used to point at with demons and evil and not just try and place it within individual moral choice. That's what I'm suggesting is actually the key. Again, really important point he just made there. And I think what we see in there is the legacy of individualism and the legacy of the Enlightenment and therefore its limitations because when you reduce evil to immorality, you lose this aspect and this quality that the ancients like Augustine had that said, no, evil is beyond immorality. It's not just the sum, the sum of individual immorality. It, something larger is both using it and created by it. Key thing that is happening here, and I don't see them actually recognizing it. I think it's implicit in what they're doing, but I think this is actually the key thing that's happening. But I think I, maybe if, I think they're fixing yeah, it on the wrong. But I, I, it's funny because I I think that someone uh, maybe I'm speaking uh, for Paul, but I think that there's a fear. People are afraid to talk about these things. 
Uh, because, like, look what I just said. I just said, I'll say, I'll, say, I'll say it straight out. I said, there's a demon that is a watcher, that is a, there's a, that's watching over a pattern of reality, and that is what is maintaining it together and making its boots work in the world. And the, the, these people are possessed and are unwilling agents of a demon, and they're bringing about this system. And it's like, okay, really? And then everybody looks, starts to look around and tries to get out of the room. Right, but the, but the point... Uh, and, and again, I mean, I think this is analogous to cheap Christianity that when someone says, okay, what you need is Jesus in your life. Well, that is what they need. But even Christians understand that, well, just maybe going down at the Billy Graham crusade or um, joining a church or doing something like that is insufficient. And and, and we, we have a terrible time in, in sort of figuring out this insufficiency. And I think it's it's for that reason that we have all this so I'm going to trigger some of you. All this Calvinist language about that—that that this is that all this stuff is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, when we listen to that through a Cartesian filter, it gets very disconnected from us, because the work of the Holy Spirit, if you understand God number one and God number two, and you understand the. the number one and number two-ness of it all, the work of the Holy Spirit means that, you know, all the way back to Augustine and Paul and Moses, these things have been coming to you. And then all the way through your family of origin and all of these, all of the events of your life. And, 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 and that's why you have this vision of this, this, this pro great providential God who, works through time and works through culture and works through events and works through all of this stuff to achieve what he's doing. And, and I, again, I think that's the proper language, but there's sort of been a cheap, um, facile, magical thinking that has happened in the church that the Enlightenment, just read Voltaire, the Enlightenment, New Atheists, many of them have exposed and they've said, you're just, you're just being cheap with language. And, and I think that's right. And so then you, you begin to, this, this is so hard to talk about. We, we just don't have the language for it yet. And, and you know, we, we don't completely agree on this, although we, we like, uh, like uh, whether or not, the, the, whether. Well, maybe I could just say one thing. So yeah. I think that our long conversation for yeah. hours and hours of conversation had made it possible for me to say that. Yeah. And I think you were able to see that I, that what I mean has is coherent. I'm using a language. I'm trying to yes. bring back yes. a traditional language to explain something which I can then, I could break it down in causalities. I could use other languages if you want, but that that language is, is also possible. And I think that what, I think that Paul, if I had Paul in a, in a private conversation and I would say, do you think there's a demon behind this? He might say yes, but he's like, I don't know how to say that. Mm. Well, he, he did say that the, the, he felt that the, the driver was metaphysical. Right, so they, pointing. he's kind of pointing towards something like that. Okay, that's an interesting question, yeah. but you're, you're, you're a professor with tenure, like you don't talk about kind of metaphysics in this in this way. Do, do you feel do you feel uncomfortable about what do you mean? So be, me, me, well, I, I do talk about distributed you, you've, you've got a reputation to protect. You've got a reputation to protect. We don't. <laughs> it's basically what I'm saying. <laughs> um, like, and and, and and there we get into the question of institutions, which will come in quite a bit later. And then it's a question that David keeps pointing to because. Um, David and Jonathan might have individual reputations to protect. They might have YouTuber reputations to protect. But John is a professor. The Christian Forum Church right now on CRC Voices, we're having a big conversation about confessionality and reputation because what's been happening in terms of the Christian Reformed Church and this, the question of same-sex marriage, I mean, it's just suddenly this, this, machinery that was felt to be archaic of confessionality suddenly is vivid all across the board where it wasn't just two years ago. Jonathan's pointing at this, that there is a discomfort with this language, a discomfort with this, but you're kind of, you're pointing in that direction with the talk of kind of distributed co cognition. Absolutely. There's other people like BJ Campbell now talking about egregores and it's sort of like overlapping with, with talk of the occult, with, with sort of areas that are not comfortably within academia, for example. I mean, uh, I, I mean, that, that goes exactly to what John just said about um, 
evil becoming immorality. I published three papers on it, so at least some part of it's comfortable in academia and in, 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 in important journals. Um, so I, I think this idea of extended cognition, extended mind, distributed uh, cognition, collective intelligence, hyper objects, hyper agents, um, I think this is all, um, I, like I said, I think it's giving. Ah, but you can't name them. And you can't, you, you, once you start naming names historically, even though we, we do all the time politically, that's what's so, it's, it's seemingly so duplicitous about the, the current conventional hegemony with respect to language around this. A metaphysics that is free from some of the his, history that Jason, uh, that uh, Jonathan acknowledged, but he, he was also, he's trying to put it aside. Like he's trying, like you, he's, like you said, there's all these images, there's all this history, there's all these horror movies, there's all this other stuff that I... But I, I don't see it as a way to, right now, I don't see it as a way to cast it aside. What I not see it aside. as a way to recapture it in a manner that will not be silly and, and superstitious and, and ridiculous. That it will actually, that I think that this moment and your work affords the possibility I, I, of going back into a medieval grimoire, right, and saying, okay, we can now understand this in a better way that the horror movie doesn't understand. I agree, I, and, and that, so give me that caveat, right, okay. and then my answer to you is, given that caveat, I'm happy to talk this way. But I, in addition to demons, I would talk about daemons, right? And I would talk about demoniums. These are all, there's a multiplicity of terms in Greek. And, we, and we've only picked up the one term. So Socrates has his demonium, his divine sign, yeah. right? Right, and there's the- and, but there's all, I, so, so it looks like we're going back, we're, we're going from just thumia to epithumia and, and daemon and demonium. And, 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 and he's right, because in language, what happened was through all the permutations of language and through the Middle Ages, we got, got to demons. And so we don't, we don't even read in that sense Augustine probably properly, but that's, that goes back to this ongoing problem that we have that, again, Brent Sockold pointed out in his book Transubstantiation that so much of what we've done is not... Luther wasn't reading Aquinas right because the language changed. And as the language keeps changing, we, we, we lose each other through time. I've been thinking about this so much and I've been trying to poke at it. There seems to be the, the positive aspect and the negative aspect of these principalities. And interestingly enough, like St. Gregory talks about the angel of the right hand and the angels of the left hand of God. Mm -hmm. And he says that the angel of the left hands are basically the demons and they're unwittingly doing the, the transcendent work without them knowing what they're doing. But yeah, so there isn't a neutral category. And I'm like, there's got to be a neutral category. <laughs> but in Islam, they have the notion of the jinn as yeah. an ambiguous category. Yes. And I think I think in Christianity, that's why, although officially in the, let's say in the theology, we only have these, this duality. In the folk religion, you'll always have the fairies and you'll always have uh, these wood, wood sprites, all these manifestations of intelligent patterns, that natural intelligent patterns yeah. that, that people talk about that, that are kind of ambiguous because you know that you know, what happens in the woods is it's ambiguous, right? It's yeah. not always, it's not good or bad. It's like, you know, it's, it, it can be, it, but it does, it still has that wonder. So I've been trying to find spaces for that, but I, I'm not totally sure I found a way to talk about it yet mm -hmm. that is coherent with, to, to have like a, yeah, this idea of these, of like the way that the daemon would have functioned in Greek culture yes. would have not necessarily been good or bad. It would just have been like something that you, that, that, Eros is considered a daemon yeah. uh, in, in, in the symposium, right? I, I dealt with that in, in a sermon not too long ago, a little bit of it, um, with the, um, oh, where was it? it? It was, oh, yeah. And, and, and then so Socrates' demonium is something that's also just uh, one step aside, because it's not a daemon, but it's a demonium. And it's, it's something like a daemon in him. Um, so it's a it's a much more it's a much more complicated and interesting taxonomy. Yeah. Um, but you have the notion of the guardian angel, like in, in some Russian theology, for example, there's a notion that the guardian angel is the best aspect of you, 
Right? Yeah. It's like the aspect of you projected into heaven, you could mm -hmm. say. And that's mm -hmm. what your guardian angel is. And that's what's kind of, if you read, when you ever, when you come to St. Gregory of Nyssa and you read the, the life of Moses, you'll see he talks about, he talks about the angel on the right shoulder and the demon on the left shoulder. Yeah. And he puts those both into Aaron. And he says Aaron is both of those at the same mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. you, you'll find it very interesting when you get there. Anyways, sorry, this is way off now. <laughs> no, no, this is still on topic. Um, there's one last thing I wanted to, to bring up, and I'll talk about Paul van der Klee, who, which, which ties a few of these things together and also pushes into something of personal interest, which is uh, the future of real wisdom and kind of this sense that, well, wrapping up the project and moving on to other things. So Paul mentioned how this area of the internet is kind of dealing with the questions, what is the nature of the civilizational crises we're facing and what are the paths out? Um, and he said part of the difficulty and the opportunity of the moment is that this little corner of the internet is what holds the heterodox community together is resistance against the hegemonic thesis institutions. But he says this makes the heterodox space to some degree always reactive and that reactivity is antithetical to the sorts of institution building that's necessary for sustained human ref And, and I, I, I got that from Peugeot, so I wasn't surprised that Peugeot didn't agree with it. <laughs> I got it from him. Information and flourishing. And this overlaps, you, you tweeted out, I think, in 2020, saying that the idea of like heterodox, rebel, dark was not a sort of sustainable platform for building new institutions or for, for whatever needs to come next, yeah. which is something intuitively that I've been finding and feeling with the narrative journey of rebel wisdom. Like it feels like it was the right thing to, to cover that insurgency. It was a real, it was a necessary moment, sort of from 2016 onwards, and covering that whole narrative was, was the right thing to do. But for me, it feels like that story has been told and that actually what's needed now is synthesis. What's needed now is actually a process of integration and not just a sort of rebellion or, or a heterodoxy. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to I mean, hear your I, thoughts I, on I, that. I agree. I even you might have not seen that tweet, but I said very early. I think like right, maybe a few months after it started, I said I do not identify with the intellectual dark web. Like I just do not identify with that name. I remember when he said that. I don't want. There's something. There's something that to me doesn't. That's not what I want. Like I don't want to do that. I don't want to be the, just a guy poking at the system because then you lose. You've already lost. Um, and I, but I think that there, there is, like, you're right, and where you are and what you want to do next, I think it's possible right now, because there was a need for some deconstruction. There was always a need to kind of break down the assumptions, and then once the assumptions are break down, you can't just keep doing that. You have to then plant a new seed. You have to rebuild it. In the parable of the sower, Christ talks about, right, the, the seed grows in the, the plowed earth. You have to do it. Plowed earth means it's not already a path. It's not already anything else. You have to kind of break down some things. And then after that, we can kind of build out of it. And so I think, damn it, I wish the best. I hope that, that, that it's something you're able to find your, your line or your path to, to create something positive. Well, we're all doing it in our own way. It's yeah. not just, yeah. it's not, it's not going to be a... Um, I, I guess the issue, um, like... like uh, on my tombstone, neither nostalgia nor utopia um, is. Um, we have to push him off that nostalgia word because I, I know what he means by it. But you know the work of Clay Rutledge, and um, who who recently wrote I don't remember maybe it was Paul Ann Leitner. Um, no, it wasn't Ann Leitner. Maybe it was Cal Zeldin. You know, wrote that basically nostalgia is trying to mine meaning from the past. Now I think there's a way in which. You can you can you can basically capture fool's gold from the past, but that that activity is actually important. And again, I think Clay Rutledge and you know one of my favorite second wave conversations of Jordan Peterson's was with Clay Rutledge, and I should probably have him on the channel and pay more attention to him. Right, um, I agree. We, we, we you know Paul and I had a recent video where we we're talking about what this what's what we're facing right now and the choices we're facing. Uh, he and I, um, and 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 the, I mean, I, uh, L.A. Paul's work comes to mind here. Like, if you could see what's going to happen in the transformation, you're not going through a real transformation. If you can infer your way through it, then you're not. You're just you're just extrapolating. And, and again, I think another another real gem in this conversation is right there. If if you can see your way through the the transformations. And again, I, I find this in Calvinist theology. 
we don't transform ourselves. We are transformed by, of course, Christianity. Conversion is being transformed by God. It's quickened. It's it's a power that comes from outside in, and then, and then changes. And again, this this shows another limitation of the enlightenment when you cut off there are no agents beyond and above human beings not even not even collective cognition or collective intelligence or or collective agencies nope 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 just just people and then then suddenly you're stuck in that conspiracy well now we're transformed by something and i think what john says here is is exactly right that this isn't this isn't something that I do or I make up. And I know this is really frustrating. It's been frustrating for a number of people who have followed me and maybe have stopped following me because they're like, well, Paul, we'll, we'll roll out your program. I don't have it. What do you mean you don't have it? Well, I don't have it. Well, Christianity, yeah, I can give you that. Was well, your program Christianity? Yeah. But it's what God is doing next. And hopefully he's using me to help birth what comes next. But even if you look at it in a sort of Peugeotian or Chestertonian, you know, seven lives of Christianity, that, that there's a resurrection coming. Well, this isn't something that I do. This isn't something that Peugeot does. This isn't something Verveke does. This isn't something Peterson does. This isn't something anything of us do. Certainly we participate in it collectively, and I think that's what we're doing here in this conversation. I think David Fuller is part of that too. We're doing this, but it will be a work of God. Um, sing unto the Lord a new song. The psalmist says, "Well, what is the what is that new song? The new song is a is a is a song. What you know, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. This is Miriam's song. Um, I will sing unto the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider thrown into the sea. The evangelical song that was made from the song of Miriam after after the triumph over the." The army of Pharaoh. Well, that's a new song. Well, what is a new song? Is it just a new song? No, it's a, it's a telling of God's new work among us of deliverance from Egypt or from Rome or from Babylon or from any of these principalities. So we're awaiting the Lord's moving again. And, and of course, he's going to move through us. Now, in terms of Moses and the Red Sea, God says, Moses, you know, you have only to stand and watch. I will deliver. I'll deliver. Other times, you know, Moses is a big participant. But that's why it's God's agency and it's God's movement. And so we don't know what he's going to do, but I believe he's moving and he's working and, and things are happening and it's coming. And it will be both same and different. It will be both old and new. Right. And so that's why I'm really resistant to utopias because it's a claim that, that you can see where, right? And then that right, and and he's exactly right in there. Really, because that utopias are products of our hands. No, nope, this isn't something built by human hands, as the Bible says. This is something not built by human hands. A temple, New Testament, I'm talking about the church. A temple not built by human hands. That that undermines what I think is happening, which is a genuine transformation. So the difficulty we're facing right now. I can't now, imagine that from here. It's basically yeah, the imaginal link is, is difficult. The imaginal link is, it's, it, it's difficult um, and, 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 it's, and it's needed. You can't do it without the imaginal link. You, you can't go through transformation without doing imaginal serious play. That's the talk I gave at Cambridge. Like ritual is absolutely necessary. But the, 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 the question then becomes, well, what are, right? We, we, we sort of, like, we deconstructed, we broke the frame, but how do we, how do we, how do we properly, I guess, how do we properly ritualize the transformation? And, and this is where, so we've spent this whole conversation talking about hyper objects and principalities and powers and all of this agency that's above and beyond us. Now, I'd want to nuance what John is saying is how do we participate in the, in what's coming next? And you might say, well, how, how do we know what's coming next? Well, we don't. We just said that we don't. Well, it's going to have old and new. It's, and, and I think this is you know, part of the strength of the orthodoxy is here's the old. Here, we've preserved it. It's right here. 
part of the strength of the Protestant is here's the new. We're we're the we're sort of the we're sort of the rough draft trying things out. We're sort of the messy laboratory of of the new. And the problem is that with laboratory, you have, you know, you know, how many elements did Thomas Edison try before he got tungsten and the light bulb? And now we've gone past that, but Protestantism is like burning through that stuff. Um, because the, the thing, and this is where there might be some significant differ, difference between Jonathan and I, although he says very provocative things about the death and resurrection of Christianity itself. So, um, um, like, I don't, I don't know, I'm not, it's not clear in my mind what, how, how we move forward and start to build a civilization. I, <clears throat> one thing I, I think, I've tried to take lessons from history I tried to take a lesson from the birth of Christianity, the notion of stealing the culture. You don't, you don't come in with a political revolution. You don't come in with socioeconomic policies. What you do is you, you, you build new homes, new ways of people being together and gathering together, and, you build, and then they network together and you, you build, you steal the culture. And, and so I think that's what has to happen. And, but I, I, it's, it, it, it comes down to very practical questions like, we're, we're trying to network a lot of these emerging communities of practice together, and we want to vet them, but we're like, who are we to do this? And where is this authority coming from? And what are the criteria by which we do the vetting? Right now, we've, we've just been relying on, I trust Jonathan and I trust Paul, but like, if we want to make a civilization, we, we, that, that's got to scale in some fashion. So um, I totally agree with that it's the, 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 I think we're at the Kairos, we're at the point of the turning. Um, I, I'm suspicious of people who just say, well, here's the answer, nostalgia, or I see the future, utopia, very suspicious of that. Um, so I, I, I don't, I don't know. I like. I. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I mean, I know I'll keep doing all of what I'm doing and stealing the culture and everything, but I'm really wrestling really deeply about how can I behave virtually and responsibly in this kairos. And I take that question. That question is haunting me because I. I I'm. I'm really suspicious. I'm suspicious of any easy answer for the reasons I've given, and, and something else. And I you know part of it is part of it is you can train your ear, and that's part of what you're doing, right? You're trying to can I hear the the first notes of the new melody? Can I hear the calling? And part of what we're we're doing is yeah, but how do I turn that in, from a metaphor into something we do, something we share? This is this is what, what and, and I'm very much where where John Verveke is in that and and. And that shouldn't be heard as a denial of my faith or a skepticism in the church. And and so I'm, I'm going to be sort of both where John Verveke is. I mean, I always, in many ways, find myself sort of between the two, especially as a Protestant. Um, where, but and, and I think they both would agree, well, the answer is in a living. It's in a lifestyle. It's in what we do. It's in... And, and so for me, obviously, it's it's continued to be inhabited in the church and to work within the church and to grow within the church, but also beyond the church in terms of estuary, in terms of these conversations, in terms of this channel. It's it's all of this, and and in a sense, I like the I like the image that that Christians use often of I'm, I'm build what I'm doing is I'm building an altar. You think about Elijah on Carmel, I'm building an altar, and. Um, I can't, I I can't bring fire from the sky to, to 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 have the sacrifice, but I can build the altar and I can bend my knee and I can pray, and you know building an altar on top of a mountain means gathering stones and, you know, with the constraint of weight and the uphillness and bringing them up to the top and, so, you know you can use that as cross bearing too but i mean that's 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 in a sense what we're doing and we're groping forward and we're we're you know seeking the lord and saying okay lord you i'm, I'm doing this work i trust you you're a good god um all of the all of the goodness i know of you so i, I do this work and i 
place my offering. I say, okay, Lord, here's, here's what I can have. Use it. Use it for your glory. Use it to bless the world. Use it to bring, um, to bring in the next chapters of the story towards the final culmination of your story. What, what, what. Um, so, um, I really want to encourage you with what you're doing, and um, I, I think you're putting yourself into trying to catch the wind of a maelstrom. Mm -hmm. And um, but if you're a good sailor, right? Um, I, there's a, one of my favorite scenes in Moby Dick, the Lee Shore. He talks about this ship, and right, and there's a storm, and it's outside of the port. And what the ship wants to easily do is just go into the port. But what it has to do is it has to marshal the wind and use the wind to go out to sea. That's what I think you're launching yourself into. And I think it is admirable and challenging. I hope I can help you. Uh, but um, I, 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 there's, uh, I've come to sort of something analogous that's really reverberating in me. It's like, how do I do what Melville said? How do I virtuously turn, right, my sails in the maelstrom so I can sail, he calls it into the open sea of truth, mm. right? Um, and I, I, and uh, part of course what, what people are wrestling with in Moby Dick is there's no easy answer. Um, so I, I, I deeply uh, empathize and admire and I hope I can be of help. I hope you will help me because, I hope mm. you'll help me because all of this is, for me this is, this is, this. Yeah, we'll all help each other. I'm, I'm Hey, come, come to Thunder Bay. We'll be, we'll be helping each other in Thunder Bay. This is for me the, the, the central existential virtue question, I think, right now. It's the most exigent, pressing. Mm. How can I be virtuous in a genuine kairos? Mm. Yeah. yeah, I want to speak to that because that's, because I framed it as talking about kind of wrapping up rebel wisdom, but obviously that's in order to, to go yeah. to something else. And it's also there's something in what you're saying about what is, what is my piece to hold? What is your piece to hold? What is your piece to hold? And they're they're different. Like you, I, yeah. I can, and my piece to hold, I think, is, is. And 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 we are all different here. So, David is a, he's a journalist. He's a filmmaker. He's going to have his piece. Jonathan, is a, artist, and now a YouTuber. He's going to have his piece. John Verveke. He's going to have his piece. I'm going to have my piece. You're going to have your piece. This is, again, book of 1 Corinthians. What happens in the body of Christ is that different people have different pieces and they play their role. More going from making things just for YouTube to trying to get more mainstream and legacy media attention on some of these ideas, some of these practices, going back, completing that kind of hero's journey of going from the legacy out into the alternative and coming back with the gold and supporting people like yourself mm. and, and shining a light on it and saying, this is significant. Hey, everyone look at this, this is significant. And this is how it fits together with other things. That's the thing that I think that I am able to bring because I've been involved in so many of these different conversations. And I've also got a sense of where the, the mainstream conversation is and what the pressure points are on that conversation right. to be able to say, this is how that relates to this and this is why it's significant because of the times we're going through. And that's the story. Like that's the story that I think I'm called to t to tell. And that now is no longer a rebel thing. It's no longer just an alternative thing. I think yeah. it was an alternative thing, and it coalesced as an alternative thing. But now it's it's time to to see how many of those pressure points we can kind of we can press on. And there's yeah, w one of those is the media side. Another of those is for me. I talked to Jonathan yesterday about going. Very sort of one of those is the media side. Another of those is for me. I talked to Jonathan yesterday about going back into the gender conversation. Mm. It feels very timely to to go back into that that in a very sort of mature way. And what does a healthy relationship, what's a healthy conversation between yeah. the masculine and the feminine look like? Because that's a huge cultural pressure point. That again, because of the the background and the stuff that I've been doing with Rebel Wisdom, is also feels like something I'm positioned to articulate. But your, your, your job is just to recreate the Axial Revolution, John. You, you haven't taken on a, a big plan at all yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I do want the Axial Revolution, not the French Revolution. But um, I love the way you talk when you talk about kind of the, the, the distributing of practices. Like, that has to be what it's about. It's like, how do you create those 
practices of virtue, those practices of connection that then become an embodiment. Well, it's it's practices. It's all the things. I mean, that's that's the difficult thing. That's why that's why the enlightenment is so limiting because it is beyond any one of us. That's why we need to have the understanding of, again, I, I think the language continues to be insufficient, hyper objects, let's say, principalities and powers. It's all of, it's distributed cognition. It, it's um, all of the, it, it's all of the, it's always all of the things that, that comes in. And, and no single one of us is sufficient to do any of it. The living thing that, that changes things rather than coming up with an idea that's going to change things. Uh, yeah, I think it's that. Um, I think we have to recover the, the distributed functionality. Like, so you could, you could move up levels of this. We used to have the, 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 the triad of the university, the monastery, and the, and the church. And the they always, they overlap, but, so I'm just talking about emphasis. The university. I'm not sure whose mic died um, or why the sound got bad, but this, this is a point that I really like too, and it, John's made it. He had a couple, few videos with a couple other conversation partners. I think this is a key point. The, 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 the triad of the university, the monastery, and the, and the church, and the university. And they, they always, they overlap, but so I'm just talking about emphasis. The university emphasizes knowledge, the monastery wisdom, and then the church emphasizes, yeah, but that knowledge and that wisdom, that better be transferable to lives, or it's worthless, right? And so we, we that functionality, right? I, I don't, I, we, it's absolutely necessary, but I don't know how we reconfigure it today. The university has spun off in its own way, and of course the church has spun off, and then it's, it keeps doing, it both spins and fragments. Paul would be the first to admit that. Protestantism is not slowing the rate at which it fragments. It's still happening, right? Um, and of course, Christian Reformed Church is probably going to have another split, and this time it'll be a very unusual split because usually churches leak left and split right. We'll see if the uh, we'll see if the progressives in the CRC can split right or split left. Um, I've still got my doubts. I, I that, that's a whole other conversation. The monastery is largely obsolete or irrelevant to most people's lives. And so how we reconfigure that, um, I don't know. Um, and, 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 but yeah, that's what's needed. Um, and I, 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 the reason why I, I, I need to talk to people like Jonathan is, I mean, I think Jonathan is tuned, has, has really finely tuned his ear to catch that melody, the first notes of it. Um, in a way that I, I haven't, and um, that's that's what I think is a, 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 a really important value right now. Hmm. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, yeah. I, I definitely. I mean, it's clearly, I have a I have a different. I mean, my my approach is I is rather. I think that the new world will be given. And I, it's hard for people to understand what that means, but I think that the world functions, worlds are built on revelation. And, and the, the difficulty of the enlightenment, the iron box <laughs> that the enlightenment creates is that there's the buffered self, there's no ability to be given. There's no revelation, there's no word from above. And and Peugeot is right that it's it's always given. Israel doesn't, rebel and get out of Egypt, the Lord comes and says, I'm taking you. Uh, Moses, well, don't send somebody else. Um, you know, and, and and then Israel goes kicking and screaming in some ways to the promised land. Oh yeah, we want to go to the promised land. They get them. No, there are giants in the land. I mean, it's always given. It's It doesn't, we don't produce it. We participate in it, but we don't produce it. It's a gift. It's a revelation. It comes from above. It's like they just are, and, and, and I hate for that. Like people, I know people struggle to understand what I'm saying, but you know, that, that's why if you look at, you, if you look at every civilization, it's always ultimately started with like some relationship between a God and a human, like every single civilization. There's always at the outset some demigod. Imperial Japan, it was the emperor. He was the divine emperor. Peugeot is right. He's absolutely right at this point. 
the, every things have a revelatory. They need a revelation in order to to start. And in Christianity, we have a sense in which there will be right. There's, there's an eschatological notion mm -hmm. that there will be a revelation, and there is a sense in which you have to live in a moment where we're calling upon that revelation. Right? You have to build the altar. Right, in the book of Revelation, you see it's like, come Lord Jesus, right? That image of the saints that are waiting and anticipate, you know, waiting with anticipation and calling upon this revelation to happen. But there's a manner in which I truly believe that until that happens, we have to take what is given and we have to make the most of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons why I, I to me, the best thing I can do is to take this, the Christian tradition and to be able to do what I can to make it as vibrant as yes. I can and to make it as real as possible. And, uh, and so it can help you understand why, I've, why I've, the, the strategy that I'm, it's not a strategy, but like why I live the way that I do, you could say it that it's, way. It's the way, it's the way of the Christian. It's the, it's, it's the Christian life. Yeah, but, but there's a notion, and, I, and I, 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 I see it in Dionysus and Maximus, so I don't think it's completely foreign to your tradition, and, but it's, it's much more pronounced in the Neoplatonic tradition about a cultivated receptivity, mm -hmm. right? A very, I, I like that. And, and you have to hear in this a, a profound kind of <clears throat> virtuosity and virtue, like, and, and this is in the key of, uh, a key thing in Taoism, right? Cultivating a kind of profound receptivity. <clears throat> There's a lot of ways in which we're blinded, uh, we're dulled, uh, we're, we're deafened, and that will, will prevent us from, I'll use your language for now, for, for, for hearing the revelation or seeing mm -hmm. it. And so I do think there's a lot we, I, and I don't think you're recommending passivity. I, no. I think there's a lot we can do um, about cultivating a deep and profound kind of res uh, receptivity that will, be, will become responsibility responding, the mm -hmm. to respond when the, the, the new insight, the new disclosure happens. I do think that is something that can be recommended right now for mm -hmm. people. I think that's right too. So I'm sure we could find another, loads of more topics yeah. <laughs> I'm talking for several more hours, but. So yeah, great conversation. I'm out of time, um, but great conversation, very exciting. Very exciting. I'm excited about excited to see what comes out next from Rebel Wisdom. I'm excited to continue to collaborate and be a part of this little corner of the internet. And you know, I want I want you all to to do it too and in whatever way that you are, of course. Um, I see Estuary as a part of this and we'll be, you know, obviously John Van Donk and I continuing to plan our trip to Europe, to the UK, to the Netherlands, to Germany in terms of raising up estuary groups and um of course go to church become a christian <laughs> that's, that's, i'm a christian minister this is what i do <laughs> but i see that as as very much part of part of this too and so yeah leave a comment i'm i'm out of time so we'll see if i get time to make videos while i'm on the road we'll see